Hi, I'm Eileen Cavanaugh. Welcome to Northern Lights, a look at Minnesota books and writers. We hope you enjoy this discussion of Minnesota literature. <laughs> like the ones I used to know Where those trees are Listen and children listen Hi and welcome to Northern Lights. I'm Jennifer Eyrick with the St. Paul Festival and Heritage Foundation, the producers of the St. Paul Winter Carnival, and I'm here with Paul Clifford Larson, author of the new book, Icy Pleasures, which is set, focusing on how Minnesotans celebrate winter. Paul, I've had a chance to look at the book and it's a wonderful book. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the book is about and how you came about writing it? Well, I'm an architectural historian by trade and I've been, I've been casting about for some time how to uh, get out of my own little bailiwick and uh, perhaps write a book of more broad interest to Minnesotans. Uh, this book was really conceived of as part of a pair. Uh, when you think about Minnesota, what do you think about? Uh, one thing is, is horrendous winters, and the other thing is, of course, all of the lakes. So this is the first of a duo, and this one is about the way that Minnesotans have uh, found ways to survive their winter and uh, do better than survive them, uh, really uh, enjoy themselves. In fact, uh, find occasions for celebration. And that is indeed how the St. Paul Winter Carnival came to be. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the story of how the Winter Carnival started and maybe how some of the other festivals in Minnesota took off from there? Well, winter sports had been going in a sort of uh, halting way in, in the state for, for many, many years. Uh, some of them came uh, from the East Coast, like uh, skating. Uh, others via uh, Norwegians or Scotsmen. But they'd pretty much been uh, very localized affairs, and, and uh, some of them, like skiing, were, were still principally practiced by farmers and small townspeople. But in the early 80s, uh, winter sports hit uh, the East Coast and Canada big time. Uh, Montreal uh, organized a number of uh, very showy, spectacular winter carnivals featuring a, an, an ice palace, and St. Paul began uh, thinking that that might be a good way to attract attention to our city and to our state as well. Uh, the perfect year arrived in 1885 when uh, a serious epidemic hit Montreal. They canceled their carnival. Uh, the St. Paul Dispatch got word of it and decided that this would be a good year to uh, organize the carnival here. And it ended up being a venue for dozens of winter sports and really introducing the state to tobogganing, to curling, to uh, snowshoeing. They, 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 well, it's a snowshoeing certainly, but they, they thought of skiing as snowshoeing too. It took them a long time, took our residents of the state, apart from the Norwegians, a long time to see the, the ski as something really uh, in itself and not simply a, a malformed snowshoe. And the Winter Carnival was instrumental in, in uh, introducing all that to the state. Now, some of those older sports I find very fascinating. Today in the winter we ski and we skate and we play hockey. Um, but I don't know that anyone considers tobogganing a sport so much, unless you're at the Olympic level. What, what, who participated in events like that? Was it the average person or were, were there teams that were formed? Tobogganing was really the uh, main mass participation sport in the early winter carnivals. Snowshoeing was a, a high society affair. Uh, a lot of people participated, but it, it costs a bit of money to, to get involved, and, and it was mostly just a, a place for someone to have new people and, and uh, industrial clubs, uh, various kinds of winter organized uh, associations to, to uh, sponsor and to hold. Uh, Tobogganing, on the other hand, was accessible to absolutely everybody. Uh, I would say the tradesmen and, and even the unemployed uh, took part in it as much as, as anyone else. It was a, a horrific sport for the period when you think of uh, people being able to go 60 miles an hour uh, down an icy slope 
uh, a runaway horse would only go half that. So it was a, a novel experience and probably a rather frightening one for <laughs> enough people to get them interested. What are some of the other unique activities that happened in those early carnivals? And I, your book also focuses on not just the St. Paul Winter Carnival, but on some of the other carnivals in the state. So if you could maybe talk a little bit about um, some of those other events that took place. Well, of course, St. Paul was the granddaddy and the only carnival of any, winter carnival of any size in the state until, oh, after, really until after World War I. Um, no, a, a number of, of very interesting winter sports uh, were at the fringes of carnival activity all the time. One of them that is my, one of my personal favorites because of the danger and speed involved was ice yachting uh, that became possible in the state really uh, when it closed down on the Hudson River in New York and a lot of the yachts became available and Minnetonka uh, residents bought them up and many, mostly Minneapolis residents that used to summer at the lake and they find or found a reason now to go out there and, and uh, do some winter sports because of the ice yachting. Um, carnivals elsewhere very often organized around a single sport or a very small uh, cluster of sports. Cross-country skiing was a, an early favorite. Uh, dog racing came in in the 1920s. Uh, what else? Tobogganing, of course, was universal. Uh, tobogganing was extremely popular right up until World War II. I'm not sure quite why it went away. Uh, it certainly is still around today, but not with the same level of intensity. I should mention that one of the reasons that tobogganing was so popular was that uh, the normal rules of social decorum, particularly between the sexes, were pretty much uh, shunted aside uh, on the toboggan slopes. Uh, a woman, of course, out of courtesy, was to sit in the front and the man behind, and that allowed the man to hold the woman any way he pleased on the way down the slope. And then, of course, when they got off the toboggan, the rules of decorum were reasserted. That's interesting. We're standing here today at Como Park, and th this has been the site for a number of carnival events. Um, what are some of the most memorable events that have taken place here at Como Park and on the lake? Well, some of them. I, I remember the tail end even as a, as a child. Um, World speed skating trials used to be held on Como Lake, and often those were tied in with a carnival. Uh, that was always a lot of a lot of fun, and even it provided an opportunity for some of us to get out onto uh, a rink that was worlds apart from the elementary school rink that we skated on nearer to our home. Of course, Como Park was also the center uh, of all of the acting out of the myth around the uh, ice castle in the late 30s. Uh, but really, by the time. Uh, the Ice Carnival, the Winter Carnival, had moved to Como Park at the end of the Depression, out of downtown St. Paul. The carnival itself had, had spread out into the city's neighborhoods. So Como Park was just one center, Rice Park was another, the east side was another, and then other residential neighborhoods also took on some activities. So Como, Como Park was, was part of that, that whole transition away from a, a highly centralized downtown uh, a real urban winter experience uh, and into more of a neighborhood experience like we have today. Paul, I had the pleasure of meeting you in the spring of 97 while you were researching your book um, when you came down to look through the archives at the St. Paul Festival and Heritage Foundation. I bet that research project that you went through was very long and very interesting. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the resources that you used to put together the information for your book? Well, I pretty well lived at the Historical Society for uh, many, many months, uh, looking through the newspaper files on microfilm and through their uh, splendid uh, photograph collection. Uh, it, was, it, it was amazing to me how much detail was written about each one of the winter carnivals in the papers. It must have been uh, just of incredible interest around the state during the period that it was taking place. It was always headlines uh, for days on end. Uh, the weather itself was as much of a headline as, as the events. There was always something crackling that happened. Either it was 50 degrees and they had to cancel the carnival or uh, it was 25 below and, 
and everybody was uh, overjoyed that, that the carnival was going to be on time and the ice was going to be thick and clear. Uh, one of the unexpected uh, parts of, of, of the research was, was having to, to discover photographs in so many different kinds of nooks and crannies, even at the Historical Society, uh, where the collection is, is in part organized uh, by the way in which things are given to the uh, society. And if, if uh, something is, is part of a, a group of winter scenes, then it's under a winter scene. Otherwise, it's uh, maybe under a festival or under St. Paul. Uh, the, the festival just, or the carnival has had so many dimensions to it over the years, a, a social and, and cultural dimension, obviously the connection to the weather, uh, certainly a commercial dimension. It was supposed to be there initially to uh, stimulate St. Paul business and to prove to Eastern investors that uh, we could still carry on business in the winter here. So there are a lot of different uh, stones to turn over even within one place. Uh, and then of course the wonderful collection which is still kind of on the way to being organized at the uh, St. Paul headquarters of the carnival. Uh, an unexpected trove that I really dug into at the last there. A lot of private collectors too. The one thing that I didn't do that I, I wish I had had time to do was find survivors of the 20s and 30s uh, festivals around the state. I think that a tremendous amount of information still lies embedded in people's memories that isn't part of the public record. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day that, that uh, more of this gets into uh, public collections. And I hope the book can help to do that. Now, the book is published by the Afton Historical Society Press, and you have published a few other works with them as well. Um, do you want to talk about your association with the press? Yes, the Afton Historical Society Press is a very young uh, organization that uh, began with the sole purpose of, of publishing really high quality books on Minnesota subjects. Uh, I was fortunate to be given the opportunity of, of putting together one of the first books that they published uh, last year. Uh, gee, it feels like a lifetime ago now. Mm -hmm. Uh, and had such a good time working on it, and I uh, found the press to be doing so much what I thought uh, needed doing that I ended up uh, introducing to them the, the proposal for this book and the, the Minnesota Summers uh, book. So I'm, uh, I couldn't be happier with what the press has, has done and with what they're doing uh, in general for the people of Minnesota, not just for uh, authors looking for a voice. Powderhorn Park in Minneapolis. Now, when you think of the Winter Carnival, you think of St. Paul, since it is the St. Paul Winter Carnival. But that's not to say that the rest of the people that live in the Twin Cities didn't do anything in the winter. Paul, could you tell us a little bit about some of the other activities that took place um, in locations such as this? Well, Powderhorn Park was uh, really the most important venue in, in the Twin Cities for a number of years for local uh, speed skating. Uh, in fact, the Silver Skates competition that, that uh, really crested at the end of the Depression, uh, and, and again after, after World War II, uh, became somewhat of a national event. Uh, what allowed all of this to happen really was the Depression, which uh, made it impossible for a major winter festival like the St. Paul Carnival to uh, make any kind of headway. So uh, sports enthusiasts had to find other, maybe humbler, venues without all of the carnival atmosphere and uh, the lake here at Powderhorn was certainly uh, fulfilling a, a large need in the early 1930s. A uh, number of amusing shots of, of uh, Model A's all lined up along the driveways here while people came to, to watch the speed skaters, which was a tremendous uh, spectator sport. A number of these photographs have come down to us. Uh, Loring Park was the venue for fancy skating. Uh, smaller rink, but uh, again, huge crowds. Fancy skating included both what we call figure skating today and trick skating, where you would jump over barrels or perform acrobatic feats. 
Uh, Minneapolis also had a number of sites where ice and snow carving took place, particularly snow carving, uh, offering art students a chance to try out their wares with a rather strange medium. What time period are we talking about that these events took place? 1920s and, and 30s was really the, the high point of uh, at least widely celebrated uh, winter activity at, at venues like this. Of course, since World War, since World War II, uh, when uh, winter sports enthusiasm, if anything, increased on a person-by-person -person basis, uh, sports like skiing and, and sliding and, and uh, skating have occurred on a number of city lakes, but not with the same media focus and uh, the same uh, sense of, I think, the sense of uh, celebration about winter. In addition to some of the events that have taken place in the greater Twin Cities area, there's also been some really unique events that have taken place in northern Minnesota. Do you have any in particular that you talk about in your book that you'd like to share with us? Well, the Depression era really brought the Iron Range to life, uh, at least to uh, winter party life, uh, in the mid-1930s. Uh, there were very strong uh, Finnish communities up there, for example, who brought some of their traditions with them and reinvigorated the tradition, uh, the traditions in the 1930s. Uh, today, uh, any number of communities, I think in particular of, of Walker and Ely, uh, two widely separate uh, communities, both culturally and geographically. Walker is on uh, the Leech Lake and, and holds what they call an eel pout festival. I, I don't know why they didn't use leeches. I mean, that's, that's right there too. Uh, they chose a purposely obscure and really pretty ugly fish uh, of almost no game value. It's very difficult to catch in the summer because they're scattered, but in the winter they pool up and decided that uh, uh, the, the town authorities and elders and, and uh, storytellers decided that uh, it was a perfect uh, sort of focus for their own distinct winter carnival, so they hold a, a, a winter festival that, that ostensibly surrounds the uh, fishing through ice for the uh, eel pout, uh, but has come to embrace a lot of other activities too. Uh, the Ely Festival is a very interesting affair that uh, began really as a, as a, a focus on, on early voyageur activity up there. The Wolf uh, Center is up there. Um, Will Steger and other great explorers, and there's this long exploring tradition that comes out of Ely and out of Ely residents. <clears throat> uh, these were the initial focus of, of the festival, and now it's grown to include ice carving and, and uh, snowmobiling and uh, a number of other activities of interest to people all over the, all over the state. Uh, I would say those two festivals and perhaps the uh, uh, Vassalopit at Mora uh, draw more people from out of the state than uh, any other carnivals and, and really vie with the St. Paul Winter Carnival in some years surpass them in terms of their uh, attraction to sportsmen from other states. We're now here in Rice Park in downtown St. Paul, which serves as the modern day heart of the Winter Carnival. And we're also right in the center of the downtown business community. Now, the business community has always been a, an important part of the Winter Carnival. Uh, what role have they played through the years? Well, the carnival is really spearheaded by uh, downtown businessmen who are uh, trying to assure people both within the city and on the East Coast that business happened here in the winter. Of course, the fact that they were able to organize such a tremendous carnival and take so much time off uh, showed that they really weren't doing a lot of business in the winter. Uh, but the, there's always been a tremendous uh, spirit of, of a, a public spirit, really, on the part of, of the downtown business community uh, as one of the pillars that, that the uh, winter carnival tradition is based on. Uh, Rice Park itself has in recent years played, as you say, a, a very important role, but it's always been a, a, a gathering place. Uh, in fact, in 1917, I believe, the carnival was actually held here. There was a, a small excuse for a, 
a nice palace that, that uh, went up right in the area where the fountain is now. And of course, there were the grand parades that, that came by here. Uh, I think back to 1916 and 1917 when the first automobiles uh, participated in the parades. Uh, 1916, they came as part of the grand parade. The weather was well below zero and so many cars broke down and so many people froze because of waiting for the parade, trying to get around the stalled cars that they decided after that they would just have a decorated car parade and keep them out of the, the main event. But all of that happened in the downtown area here. There were also a lot of employee groups that participated in the old carnivals and kind of served as uh, support groups for the carnival. What, what were they like? Well, probably the largest of these was established by uh, George Finch, the first carnival president, whose own company, Finch Van Slyke and McConville, was located uh, uh, over in Lower Town. Uh, I think his men were pretty much browbeat into uh, forming a, a, a workers sort of uh, club. Uh, their wives were invited along too. Uh, but the thing is that once, once you get a few of these clubs formed, then uh, volunteer uh, clubs begin to spring up. Uh, a number of, of small industries began to form their own clubs just to sort of keep up with the Joneses. Uh, somewhat to the chagrin of some of the early male founders of the carnival, a number of the women were unwilling to settle for uh, just being spouses uh, as, as members and formed their own carnival associations. Uh, participated in the parade. Uh, it really became a, an affair that embraced uh, all segments of, of society, both genders and all ages, uh, certainly all social classes. Jingle around the clock, mix and a mangle in the jingle and beat. That's the jingle bell, that's the jingle bell, that's the jingle bell. We've been chatting today with Paul Larson, author of the new book, Icy Pleasures, published by the Afton Historical Society Press. Paul, I want to thank you for your time today. It's been very interesting talking to you and reliving some of the memories of Winter Carnival. Thank you. The Winter Carnival continues to be a wonderful event. I'm sure another history could be written 20 years from now that will be completely different. <laughs> I'm sure it will. After 112 years, I'm sure we'll keep going strong for another 112. The 1998 Carnival will be held January 30th to February 8th and will feature a number of the traditional activities that everyone's come to know and love, including the ice sculptures right here in Rice Park, the Grand Day Parade, the Torchlight Parade, lots of family and children's activities. We've got sporting events, softball on ice, a frozen 5K and half marathon, even car racing on ice, provided the ice is solid and a lot of other great activities for everybody. So we encourage you all to join us and thank you again, Paul, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. Clarence Johnston entered his profession during a period of unusual public interest in architecture. In Minneapolis and St. Paul, two generations of sometimes pretentious, but on the whole, naively designed buildings, and in some cases, makeshift buildings, were going down to rubble and being replaced uh, by structures of real artistic uh, merit. Uh, structures whose owners believed would make them and or would have the dignity uh, to remain integral parts of the urban landscape for the life of the city. Of course, by this time we know better than that. Even some of the most outstanding buildings of the 1880s uh, are no longer with us. But what was occurring in Minneapolis and St. Paul when Johnston came here in 1882 was somewhat unique. While the rest of the country still languished in the throes of the uh, depressed economic conditions of the late 1870s, 
Minneapolis and St. Paul were growing by leaps and bounds. Between 1880 and 1883, both cities doubled in population. And with uh, that population growth and obviously a lot of coverage in the Eastern press, uh, a number of fledgling architects of superior ability and superior training uh, flocked to the Twin Cities uh, to begin in an area which uh, they would hardly have dignified with their presence five years earlier. Five years earlier, these would have been regarded as hayseed beginnings indeed, and they would have stuck with uh, a very small level of apprenticeship uh, with an Eastern architect. Johnston was among these. He left his post as one of the designers for the Herder Brothers, the leading interior architects. They called themselves interior designers, but really did a lot of architecture as well uh, on the East Coast. Uh, he came here on a gamble, but it was a gamble uh, that was very easily taken by architects of his period <clears throat> because of uh, the enormous uh, success that Minneapolis and St. Paul were experiencing. Um, as a young man, just ready <clears throat> to spend his only term at MIT. MIT was the hotbed of classicism, uh, at least the hotbed of, of uh, classical training. This is Johnston's own studio shortly after he arrived in, the, in uh, late 1882. Uh, utter chaos, uh, sort of what we imagine sometimes when we think about a late Victorian house. A wonderful uh, late cottage sort of building. I, I speculate that this is uh, one of half a dozen cottages that uh, Johnston designed uh, at White Bear Lake shortly after he came here. It could have been a sketch devised earlier. Only two of those survived. The other three we have no uh, visual remains of, uh, not even on paper. This is Johnston's only essay in uh, Victorian uh, sort of colonial revival. This was his commercial breakthrough. Uh, again, uh, a building that's done with a great deal of tension, and he's kind of dabbling in, in both <coughs> pools here. So we can see, again, something like the emphasisism going on, but an emphasis on vertical units, an emphasis on, on upward alignments, which is not neoclassical, uh, still relates somewhat to the Gothic tradition. Jacobean style, again used uh, for St. Paul Central High School. This had become sort of the way of designing high school buildings. Uh, where he was allowed to wander a bit was at Northrop and uh, at Walter Library. Northrop, even the exterior, obviously could not match the exterior of the buildings and he found in German neoclassical opera house design. In many cases, it meant that his buildings would not have the pictorial strength of right or the scholarly rigor and uh, highly integrated ornamental surfaces of Gilbert's buildings but they'd be buildings that lasted because they were buildings that were responsive to what his clients needed and to what the structure called for.